other data we have um, is our class poll, which uh, a lot of people filled out. So that's great. Thank you very much. Um, and then I guess my outline for today is uh, class uh, plays session. <laughs> um, and we'll add things as we go. And yeah, I'll update that later. So hopefully everybody's doing all right. Uh, first week completed, settling into all your courses. Um, we've moved the time to this time. So I admitted defeat and took the time that they assigned me uh, for the, uh, the lecture. It actually worked out better um, as it is anyways. Um, at some point initially, I was trying to say, let's do early morning and afternoon. Um, but people are taking a bunch of other classes, so those overlap. And we know this slot has no overlap, so hopefully it works. And hopefully it's not too late for people. Um, in Asia. So part of it was looking at uh, our time zone distribution here. So uh, we, well, there's GMT. Okay. Um, how did it label it? Maybe I had it filled in already from last year. That's good. Um, so obviously quite a few people here. This doesn't seem right. Or people are putting 5, 5.3. I haven't looked at this in detail before. The numbers are not sorted. I don't understand where that's coming from. Then. <laughs> I will need to analyze this separately. Um, number up, sorry. So here's another example of a bad chart. Like, why is it not sorted? <laughs> I can't tell um, where we are. Um, but usually um, a good third of the class is in uh, India or China for this on online um, region. Um, so uh, time zone is a bit of a problem. And I guess it's still before midnight in China, so hopefully it's not too bad. Um, <laughs> yes, that's why they're not. Uh, there's, there's so many examples of bad um, ways to show your data. Now, this isn't a visualization course, but hopefully we'll see good examples and bad examples over time. And uh, we can uh, use that to sort of do better things uh, to make people understand data, mostly to help us understand the data. Um, and get well, whatever we're looking out of it, right? Because it's an engineering. Um, course, so you're usually analyzing data in order to solve some problem or to make a system work better or to find the problem or the anomaly or the uh, energy loss, you know, in, in your system. So um, visualizing your data is important. And um, that you could do an entire course on fancy ways to visualize things, but uh, basic data analysis usually gives you something that you can visualize or understand a bit better. And that's a good metric for um, whether your analysis is working, if the plots make sense. So um, we'll show examples like this as we're going and try to think of different ways to um, represent your results and to extract information from data that way. And in your assignments, you'll um, be trying out different types of plots and um, ways of analyzing data and uh, trying to basically get practice doing that. Um, so most people are staying put, although a good bunch are traveling. Most engineering students, most the ECE students. We've got a bunch from other departments. Um, so this one is uh, the the way it works now, which is that it's mostly um, course based and people doing research and other. I'll define what other is. Um, one thing I forgot to mention um, when I was talking about assignments earlier. Um, was an option that if you're a research student and you want to do something different for like your last assignment or something that's related to your research, I'm open to that. Um, you, know, you can do it on your own, you could do it in groups as well. Um, but uh, it would be interesting to see if there's something specific to this course that you're trying to get out of it for your thesis, your master's or your PhD thesis, um, and you have a project in mind that you can do and it's kind of relates to this, ping me or a set up a meeting on the bookable meetings and we can chat about it and you can maybe replace the last assignment or something like that with a, a project as long as you're willing to share it with the class. And so if it's really 
cool, maybe you could present a, a summary of it in one of the last lectures. So we used to do that for everybody, but the course is so big now, it's it's kind of infeasible. Um, so that's just a thing for people to to know. I can try to add that to the um, description. Um, okay, so most people have some familiar with Python. That's good. Um, it's going to be what we're using. And then in terms of the concepts, um, I did this just to kind of um, give me a sense of where people are. And it's good for you to see it too, if you can kind of know where your classmates are already, that things that are kind of just well understood and, and known, you could probably guess what mean squared error is, if, even if you've never ever seen it written down exactly. But um, I guess you should have seen that this week by watching the videos. Um, Cross-validation may be something that uh, you may not have seen before when you started, and that's kind of related to all this data processing and analysis, and then more things. So these parts are what we're doing in a couple of weeks, which is really feature um, extraction, trying to find patterns in data, new representations of data that help us find patterns better. Um, and it's doing it without learning. It's kind of a statistical methods. So we're going to have a, a week on lots of methods for that, and this is expected. You guys haven't heard about that. And then we start getting into classification methods, k, k means, base rule. And it's interesting that it's even <laughs> towards people saying, I've heard of it, I've used it, I've never heard of it. Um, so that's cool. Um, that's why we'll talk about that in depth. Why do I have cross-validation twice? Because cross-validation is great. You should have cross-validation twice. It's actually funny to have cross-validation twice because now I can compare the answers of the two and see how stable everybody is. On the second question, 45% of people said they never heard of cross-validation, even though there was a question about it three questions earlier. That is interesting. <laughs> that also tells you, which is useful for everyone uh, in all your data sets, is that you can't trust your data, <laughs> right? So you guys are filling out this poll and you're obviously doing it honestly, um, but you may not be checking, cross-checking all the answers. <laughs> so your answers are not entirely reliable, right? Um, and so the data has noise in it. Um, and so now we've seen that the noise, the difference between 45 and 35, no, sorry, um, 38 on question one is basically totally random noise, right? So if you have a thing in some part of your data set, we say, well, this one's 22 and this one's 26, that is not significant, right? Because we've seen cases where the exact same question has a six point difference and Obviously, the answer should be the same. So in this data set, we'd have to have um, a difference of like maybe 20 or 30 to say, okay, this is actually different. People, less people know about SVM than do know about it. That is meaningful. Um, and decision trees people have heard of. So we can um, go through that kind of a bit more quickly, although there's lots of related stuff with it, which text boost is a decision tree method an ensemble method using decision trees and other methods on top of it um, that people haven't used and is a very powerful easy to use accessible method so you should know it and we'll get to that and then neural networks um people have heard of the basics but haven't maybe used them because the three was like i've used it two was i know what it is um and that is kind of expected so we'll be talking about lots of that especially um, specific methods for making neural networks work better and be trained more efficiently like Atom Optimizer and transfer learning. Interesting stuff. And why people taking the course? I need it, I have to, I want to. Um, I'm interested in machine learning, I'm interested in data mining. Okay, so lots of people still want to learn data mining. I wonder sometimes because it's less popular as a catchphrase in jobs and media anymore, but um, it's still an important aspect of uh, industry, right? So um, it's about accessing and representing the data. Um, and then some fun questions. It's always good to know generationally if you let me see how old I feel. Um, we're still on Harry Potter, which makes me feel okay because that means I still understand what you guys are talking about with Pokemon's a little further, although I know it, although the Maze Runner, Attack on Titan, I know, but I don't really know. Um, and uh, still pretty strong Star Trek. No. Oh, no, Star Trek's very small. That is disappointing. What did you guys add? Sinchen, One Piece. I know One Piece. Parks and Rec. Okay. 
very specific. There you go. And favorite number, another total random thing, this is what random noise looks like because I asked you your favorite number and this should not have any pattern of meaning. Um, and it doesn't, right? But it looks like you try to say, well, five is more popular and 25 is more popular. And for some reason, 100 is popular. Um, but this is random noise. And there's usually not much of an explanation. Although you could have cultural explanations like eight is less popular and six is less popular. This is expected. Surprising the 42 is not more popular. Sometimes that shows up as more popular. Cool. Yeah, it could be the extremes. People want to be different and say, oh, I want to say somebody put pi. One person put pi. Well done. I didn't know you could enter. I guess it was a text field. Everyone just typed text and someone typed pi. I think I must have said I didn't say integer. So, um, yeah, high and low. People have biases towards, um, you know, the edges of things, too. And we'll see this with probabilities. This doesn't really fit with that, but... Um, I'll try to, maybe I can try to find something to show you guys about it. That um, if you're talking about probabilities and it's a probability that someone gave you, like their assessment of how likely something is, you definitely see patterns like this. People think a low probability um, is, is higher um, than it really is. So things that are, you know, 1% chance or 4% chance, they essentially see it as much more likely, like 20% chance. Um, we're seeing that a lot right now with the, Vaccines, right? AstraZeneca has like a one in a hundred thousand, or maybe one in fifty thousand chance of um, having this blood clot issue. Um, and people don't compare that to other risks in their life, which are already that high, and they experience every day. Um, they just hear that and they go, "Oh, it's like that's pretty likely." It's like, no, it's less likely than a car crash or a plane accident. Um, no, I think plane accidents even less likely, but. So um, people are not rational about probabilities, um, and sometimes they're not even about numbers, but uh, that's just something you have to work into. If your data comes from people self-assessing, um, you have to be careful that way. Cool, so any comments or, or interesting thoughts from all of this? Oh, we got so many pages. Um, what kind of distribution, um, Ruda asks, what kind of distribution is the favorite number histogram can be classified as? I mean, it's pretty close to uniform, right? So, I mean, if you have a uniform distribution, which just says, you know, probability um, 2%, 3% um, of picking a number and you sample from it, some numbers will just naturally get picked higher than others. Um, so, uh, it wouldn't be that far from this. The fact that it's exactly, it's kind of weird. Although we're also seeing here, um, we're not seeing it spaced out with the gaps in between. So this graph is not great. I should replot this. Um, it's, it's, it's discarding all the gaps, right? So 12, like 10 is not even shown. Um, the only thing that's an interesting effect is there's a bias on high numbers at the edges, like I said, maybe there's a bias towards one in 100. And you could have some cultural biases about certain numbers. So maybe you'd have a, a lower probability of Gaussian around six because of um, Chinese culture and some other number because of a different culture. Um, 13 usually is less likely because it's unlucky in some cultures. So yeah, also uniform um, distribution. Can I draw on my thing? No, what am I drawing on today? I did not think about that. Um, okay. This is literally the easiest thing to just draw on. Um, right, a uniform distribution, um, you are, uh, you've got, and what we have. That's just going to be the probability of uh, of a sample, and you'd have some range x. So you don't know what your range is. Here, our range was zero to one hundred. Um, right, uniform. You're going to get something that's just around a fixed size. Right. Um, Gaussian will give you something like that, um, where 
It's also called normal because it's so common, everyone likes it. So they called it normal. Um, so it's hard to use normal in machine learning to say, that's the normal thing. When you say normal, you mean Gaussian? It's like, no, no, I don't mean Gaussian. I just mean it's normal. Um, it's unfortunate, uh, right? And so Gaussian has um, a mean and a, um, a variance, which tells you essentially where the center is. Um, and that's the, the mean. Mean we usually represent with mu and the variance we represent with um, sigma. I will write this in LaTeX so you know what I'm talking about. Um, so mu tells you where, where it's centered and um, sigma tells you um, how much variance there is um, about it. And that kind of defines the shape, but it's kind of a, a, a balanced shape, a curve on both sides. But even when you and when you sample from it, though, we say, okay, we're going to have, we're going to pull. In this case, we pulled ninety-three samples. Um, right, x is uh, the size of x is ninety-three, um, and x is a set um, sampled from um, sample from. We're assuming um, uniform. Um, 0, 100, but I would say it has something like maybe a Gaussian at 98, or maybe a Gaussian at 99, right? Um, it's just getting cut off because um, we can't put a number higher than 100, right? And it's got something, a pretty small variance. Um, and it may even have a minus Gaussian, well, it has some kind of weight on certain numbers, I would say. Well, that's not evident from this, so we'd have to decide. This is my theory. Great. Okay. So what else should we talk about? Um, I'll go back to my list. Did this. Um, we've seen something about where everybody is. I'm going to put those on a map. You wish to do that. Um, I'll say some stuff about course plan. I don't know if you can see that. All right. We can get rid of this now. Um, I will release a more detailed schedule soon. Um, I have to kind of update my spreadsheet. I'm really uh, multitasking this term, right? So I've got certain periods of the week that are your course and certain periods of the other course. And then there's research and there's other things as well. And my sister had a baby last week, so family stuff was all over the place. Yay. Um, so I think we're on track, but uh, there's, uh, there's some stuff that I have to catch up with for your course to give you guys the full calendar. I have it as a spreadsheet about the weeks. You can see it on Learn. Um, you can see um, the um, upcoming topics and read ahead um, in terms of that. Um, but the thing that you don't have much of is uh, the assignments and due dates and stuff. So um, I will update those in the next day or two and send it out. Uh, the first assignment um, will be on these first few weeks of topics. So on, um, now I've lost the chat on the data analysis stuff that you talked about, uh, that you looked at this week on the basic um, training and validation, cross-validation, similarity scores, um, looking for outliers. Um, it'll be using a simple classification algorithm called K nearest neighbors. Um, you should, so next week's, like this coming week now, um, the topics are to look at these uh, week two things is basic classification um, and probability statistics. So if you've got your probability stat stuff down cold, you can kind of just skim that and you're fine. If you don't, you can look into it and we can talk about more resources. Um, parameter estimation and decision trees. Yes, what do you even get there? So um, the first assignment kind of just goes up to week two or three. And um, it will be 
release soon, a couple days, and then we do uh, June 4th. So you'll have like three weeks to do it. Hopefully it's just a nice setup for um, getting your Python environment set up and doing some basic things with some small data sets. And then um, I will also release the other week's things once I check them um, to make sure it all makes sense. OK, so that makes sense for people. Um, and then we've got, are there any like specific questions and stuff? Because I had some questions on uh, Piazza that we can kind of go through. Um, I don't have necessarily the answer for all of them yet, but I, I looked at them and I thought about a bit of an answer so we can talk about it. Um, yeah, so in terms of um, groups, uh, clear in my big block of words. Um, once uh, the assignment is released, there'll be a, a section on learn um, to, to join groups. Uh, where you can kind of basically do that. So it'll be in groups and it'll be this thing that you join and you can sign up um, for everybody. Like it basically be set up so there's enough groups for everyone and you put your name under one of them. So you and your friend um, join a group. Uh, and if you're doing it on your own, you still join a group, but you just put your name in it. Groups are just for assignments and there are two. Um, and as always, you should check the, um, the outline for the course um, because it has um, some of this information. And when it says, uh, if I update something, I'll put it on there. Yes, Google Colab's great. You should use Google Colab. Um, Google Colab is a um, like a hosted uh, cloud instance of Jupyter Notebooks that kind of customized for Google stuff. Uh, so you can basically load your data into that, run it. It even lets you run it on their compute a bit, and then um, you try to basically write your report in that um, in that notebook. Um, and then um, export it to a PDF. It's a little finicky getting the PDF to fit into CrowdMark, but it makes it much easier for us to grade. To grade. So it is worth it for you to do that so that we can grade you properly. Um, if you make your assignment in LaTeX, it'll be much easier for you to turn it into a PDF and it'll be beautiful. Um, you just have to figure out how to put code in and all that. But um, if you're a graduate student, especially a research graduate student, you definitely should know how to use LaTeX. And if you don't, this is a great reason to um, learn because you can't do research without knowing um, how to write documents in LaTeX. Are we allowed to use CUDA? Yes. I don't think I ever mentioned CUDA in any lecture. Um, although I should in the convolutional neural network part. Um, many of the libraries, when you're doing deep learning, it might implicitly use uh, CUDA. So CUDA is a... Um, Library, if people don't know, a cool um, for uh, for um, doing parallel uh, computing, right? So it uses your graphics card. Oh, this is why NVIDIA is so popular. Um, you can use CUDA to basically run your code on all the little computing units of your your library, your um, graphics card. Right? So graphics card basically does parallelized. Um, linear algebra very fast, and that's exactly what you need for neural networks. So um, yeah, you can use it. You won't need it until the deep learning stuff. But. OK, so. I'm looking at specific questions now. What's the difference between them? Slide eight, measuring similarity. Perfect. So I have to find the slides.
Does anyone want to answer the person the, the question there? Feel free to answer each other. Um, not the expedition academy. Shortest question I will answer. But uh, 